Good morning, how's everybody doing? Good. It is warm up here. I got a fist pump from Shane. Everybody, yes, one fist pump. You guys tired? Yeah. A little bit, yeah. You know there's like another 50 centimeters of snow coming, so <laughs> something like that, yeah. Uh, before we start, I wrote something on my hand right here. And you can't do this very often with very many people, but I've gotten to know this, this fella. He's become a, a good friend of mine. And it's his birthday today. And I didn't know this, but uh, at our LIT breakfast, a bunch of them told me that uh, it's Adam DeVister's 29th birthday today. And he's so embarrassed. <laughs> his face is beet red. I'm not sure if I've ever seen that color on a human being. <laughs> so on the count of three, let's just say happy birthday, Adam. One, two, three. You're lucky we're not singing, because I realized, it was like, we're going to sing, and I was like, no, I'll be mic that means I have to sing, so that's not going to happen. So today, the kids are going to stay in the service today, uh, because it's U18 Sunday, and it's just the Sunday where we try to advocate uh, for kids, we try to include, try to do some intergenerational stuff, and so I have presents up here, I thought, what person doesn't like presents, young and old? Who does not like getting presents? Put up your hand. Who loves to get a present? So half of you are lying. Half of you are not telling the truth. But before we do that, as, as Dave shared this morning, uh, there's a couple things that we should um, keep you in the loop about. So our midweek has started. So our midweek kids started last week and youth has been going for a couple weeks. So invite your friends, tell your neighbors. Uh, it's really, we don't advertise in the community sort of semi on purpose because we want our kids and our teens to do uh, the sharing uh, for themselves. So they invite their own friends. And so that's really important. And we're off to another great semester and we're really excited about all the things we're going to do uh, in the coming months and weeks. And also, snow camp is coming, so that's in two weeks. And so that's going to be a lot of fun. We need uh, your prayers, we need your support, uh, your patience when we come home. It's a lot to jam into two days, but we're very excited. And actually, he's now pastor, Mark Anderson. Uh, he's the district, or then actually the national youth guy. It's actually, they've kind of shifted, the EMC's kind of shifted their focus from just youth ministry to kind of next generation ministries. And he partners up with the EMC, the denomination, um, in the next generation ministries. And so he's actually coming to our snow camp. So I got to, I've gotten to know him uh, the last couple of years at, at Mishua, and he's become a friend, and I, I really appreciate his perspective and what he brings to youth ministry and next-gen ministry. So he's coming to give some leadership at snow camp, and so I'm very excited about that, and I think our teens are really going to benefit from that. So uh, keep that uh, in mind, and inv again, invite your friends, bring your registration forms, it's super important. For the kids this morning, we have a special uh, coloring sheet. This is Jesus coming in on the colt. That's, we're not even close to Easter, but this is the coloring sheet. If you want to color what we are doing today, that is it. If they're in the back there, you can go grab one. And over the last several months, I've had the opportunity to kind of preach every fifth week. And I've really relished this opportunity because it's a chance to tell kind of the story and update you where we are as kind of U18 ministries in terms of the stories and the things we're learning about. And so if you were here before Christmas and we saw Lazarus come out of the tomb, we're just going to pick up right from that moment on uh, because it's a super important story. And in order to do that, we do a little bit of review. So in the fall, we learned that Jesus is the good shepherd. And there's three words that we tagged to the good shepherd. Who can remember them? Paige. He's fearless, and he's also forgiving. Paige is, good job, Paige. So the good shepherd is our friend. He's fearless, and he's forgiving. And the good shepherd is the one who breathes life. What three words do we tag with Jesus' is life breathingness? Paige, for 400. It's right there. I can see it coming out of your mouth. Silenced and seeking, right? 
basically everybody. And so this next section, from basically now until May, the U18s are going to be looking at the, like the last 10 days of Jesus' life, the last couple months of his life. That we have been going, I have been going through the Bible with our, starting with our kids before I was even in youth ministry here in Genesis like six years ago. This is like a long, long haul. And we're just getting to like the really, really good stuff. The real earth shattering stuff with Jesus' life. And so we're going to slow right down. And Jesus, th this series is called he, his, Building His Kingdom through peace, through prophecy, and through people. And so that's what we're going to pick up today. But in order to do that, I want to ask you a question. What do you expect from God? What do you expect from God? And what do you expect from the church? What are your expectations for the church? Just like a present, there's actual presents in here. We have expectations around gifts, and I need six people to kind of realize those expectations this morning. We're going we're gonna to do across the board. So I need someone who's a child under the age of 10. <laughs> Alan, I know you act that age. But somebody... <laughs> Jesse, come on up. I need someone, so Jesse, I need someone who's, just wait there Jesse, I need someone between the age of 60 and 80. Don't be shy. You're halfway. 60 and 80. Paul, oh, come on up. You don't have to share your age, it's totally okay. So, Jesse and Paul, you can choose one of these gifts, there's six, you can choose one. Just kind of hold on to it and then stand on the stairs, please. I need someone who is between kind of... That's okay, yeah, go for it. Go for it. And make sure the number is kind of... Uh, stand on the stage. You can want to stand on the stairs there, Paul. Make sure that everyone can see the number of your present there. I need someone who is... What did I write down here? A 20-year-old. I need a 20-year-old. Yeah, come on up. Come on, Jess. And someone who's between 30 and 40. I'm disqualified from this one. 30 and 40. I, if you don't raise your hand, I will choose you. I see a hand in the back. There's this young man. I, who's that back there? Oh, it's Eric Cudney. Come on up, Eric. I need someone who is... Two more people. Oh, how many do I have? One, two, three, four... I need a 50, 60 year old. Someone in their 50s. Sorry, I'll start guessing ages and that will be embarrassing. Okay, Karen, come on up. And one teenager to mix it up. Sam, we talked about this at youth. Remember? Sam's like, I'll do this on Friday. And here she is. Okay, so you got one, there's one, one. So this game, so if you just want to flip the slide there, Roger. It's a very simple game. It's called the gift swap game. So you want to sit down the stairs there. No, I don't. So you just inspect your presents. These are actual real presents. Don't, don't, yeah. Just be a little bit gentle. This is the, the, the first round of this game is basically you can keep it or you can swap it with somebody else. Okay, so we're going to start with the eldest first. Paul, you get to choose to keep your gift or, or exchange it for one of these other presents on the stage. Oh, I'll keep it. He's going to keep it. Jesse, you get to keep or, or change. You're going to swap it for which one? The red one, okay. So you got to change. You got to switch there. Okay. Eric, you can keep or swap. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, Sam, you get to keep or swap? A swap. Okay, you go for it. I'll swap. Oh. Okay, number, number four, you get to keep or swap? I swap. I don't know if you want to. 
And number, you got number four now? Keep her swap. Uh, I'll swap. <laughs> so before Christmas, we, we, we left off with Lazarus. He was in the tomb. His sister, his sister's Mary and Martha. They were very sad. And Lazarus comes out of the tomb and he's alive. And the whole town is bursting with excitement. But not everybody. Christina shared this morning from John that news got around that Lazarus had been raised from the dead. And Jesus' fame grew and grew and grew. And there's this movement uh, began to take place of people in the high-ranking authorities forced, trying to forcibly stop Jesus from growing in popularity because there's a legitimate fear about what they expected from Jesus. And so in the second round of the gift swap game, I kind of told a half-truth. Only one of these gifts is actually worth keeping. <laughs> Uh, mo most of them I actually can't give away. <laughs> it's church's property. But one of these gifts... <laughs> one of these gifts is candy. Uh, so five of the six gifts you cannot keep. One of them is candy. You can expect your gift now if you want. Don't, don't, don't be deceived. Don't, don't think you know. So the second round, we're going to start again. I'm going to give you one second to decide to, to keep it or swap it. Paul, we're going to start with you. Swap, swap. Swap. <laughs> okay, Jesse? Keep. Keep. You're going to keep? Eric, uh, Karen? I'm going to keep. Keep? Eric? Uh, I'm going to swap with Sam. Okay, you swap with Sam. Sam? Keep her swap. Swap. <laughs> Great news, I'm last. Okay, you're last. Oh. No, not yet. No, 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 no. No, no, no. So I'm just going to let you uh, just stand there for one second. So Caiaphas, the designated chief priest that year, there's some confusion around who is actually the high priest in those times because of the merging kind of cultures and this really political power game that's going on. It's a really complicated history, but you can look it up at home. But Caiaphas is the acting chief priest and he says, don't you know anything? Can't you see that it's our advantage that one man dies for the people rather than the whole nation be destroyed? And from that day on, they plotted to kill him. And Jesus no longer went out in public. There's this shift in John. I think John picks up the, the best out of all the gospel writers. He picks up this little, this subtle shift. The story changes. The expectation around Jesus changes. But now there's an actual forcible movement to plot to kill Jesus. For the final round of the gift swap. This is your last chance. And we're going to start in reverse order if I can remember. You get to keep or swap, and at the end, we're going to open our presents, okay? And one of you will go home with something wonderful. Sorry. Oh, what do you have there? Keep. Six? You're going to keep it? Yeah. Okay. Sam? Um, swap. Swap. Yeah. <laughs> Eric? Sam? I'm Ka keeping. Karen, can you keep? Jesse? Keep? 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 Yeah. Okay, so let's start. Give them a hand. Give them a hand. That's good. That's, that's, that's a lot of pressure. So we're going to start. Who has number six and who has number one? Open your presents now. Six and one. This is like Christmas. <laughs> Diapers. That is helpful. What do you got there? Dinner. Church property. Church property. Oh. Church property. Church property. Gold coin and not the chocolate kind. No. That's too bad. So you guys can go grab a seat. You guys are disqualified. You lost. You're the worst. I'm the worst. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, we need number four. No, number, sorry, number five and number two. You can open up your gifts right now. Yeah. yeah. What do we have here? Oh. Oh, this is this, this is good stuff here. This is like oh, some clay and a picture of Jesus. That's yes. You can't keep that. That's important. That's you, Paul. You can have that if you want. If you want to make some clay, you can have that. All right. Awesome. And number three and number four. Who thinks it's number three? Who thinks it's number four? Give yours a little shake there, Sam. Careful, careful. Hey, open up your presents. What do you got there? That's in, that's that's special. That's the Ark of the Covenant. Monopoly hey, you can't keep that though either. That's that's not mine. What do you have there, Sam? Ask Roger in the sound room for the, ba the basket of candy. There's enough for everyone. Oh, Roger. Let's go get it. Sure. Yeah. Go get it, Sam. Ooh. It's a good game. Sam, how about you come on up for one second? So there's baskets of candy here. And everybody, when you leave today, you can have candy when you leave. So give Sam a hand for being... You want to, those, you want to take him to the back door? Just one of each of the doors, that'd be great. So Roger, you can go back to the other slide. So give our contestants a hand, that's a lot of pressure. No one probably expected the lightest box to be filled with candy. Because sometimes our expectations are a little bit different than what we see in reality. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to John 12. So this is just continuing on from where we just finished reading. Six days before Passover, Jesus entered Bethany where Lazarus, so recently raised from the dead, was living. Lazarus and his sisters invited Jesus to dinner at their home. Martha served. If you can remember, this is where we left off before Christmas. Lazarus is the one sitting at the table with them. Mary came in with a jar of very expensive aromatic oils anointed and massaged Jesus' feet. Then he wiped them, then wiped them with her hair, and the fragrance of the oil filled the house. Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, even then getting ready to betray him, said, Why wasn't this oil sold and the money given to the poor? It would have easily been, been uh, brought in 300 silver pieces. He said this not because he cared two cents about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of their common funds, but it also embezzled them. Jesus said, let her alone. She's anticipating and honoring the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you. You don't always have me. Word got out among the Jews that he was back in town. The people came to take a look, not only at Jesus, but also at Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead. So the high priests plotted to kill Lazarus, because so many of the Jews were going over and believing in Jesus on account of him. The next day, the huge crowd that arrived for the feast, that heard Jesus was entering Jerusalem. Now John who I really love John's perspective. He's not always, he doesn't always tell the Gospels in a strict chronology. 
he, he's looking for something a little bit different in his writing. That's why he stands apart from the other three. But this account of Jesus entering the city of Jerusalem is, is written and told in each of the Gospels. And John just says a very little bit about this, that Jesus is entering the city. But that little phrase, entering the city, packs so much importance. That if you didn't read the other Gospels, you may miss out what John was actually saying. Because I think John was writing in the context that you, everybody knew what that meant. So if you look at the other Gospels, they each kind of tell it slightly differently. But basically, right after Lazarus, he's sitting at the table, Lazarus is there, Mary, the scene is kind of reset where Mary and Martha are in their house and Martha's cooking and Mary is at Jesus' feet once more. And remember, there's just no anxiety in that scene. There's like a gentle calm. And outside of the house, there's all sorts of people. There's a buzz about Jesus. People coming from all over, asking, who is this man? What did he do? People coming to see Lazarus because... In those days, people weren't that brought back from the dead. Dead people stayed dead. And they wanted to see with their own eyes how on earth is this possible. And so, not, so the, the, the ruling class, high in anxiety, say, we have to stop this. We have to stop Jesus. And now we have to stop Lazarus. We can't let this, this spread. And so inside the house, there's this calm, tranquil peace. Outside the house, there's this growing anxiety and growing buzz and growing anticipation. And there's this shift, this very, very subtle shift in the story that has enormous consequence. Because in the other three Gospels, Jesus asks His disciples to go into this village and find me a colt that I have prepared. And in this story, in this context, the disciples, their ears would have perked up immediately. And they probably would have whispered to each other, a colt? An unridden colt? Are you serious, Jesus? Now's the time. In those days, to, for someone to ride in on, a, on an unridden colt, in this symbolic gesture, was, was that only kings would do that. It was, a, it was a symbolic gesture of a king entering into his city, victorious or after a coronation, and, and for hundreds of years, the kings of Israel would have gone, probably gone through this procedure of riding on the back of an unridden colt as the people kind of congratulated you into the city. And the moment those words come out of Jesus' mouth, that he's asking for the colt, he sets in motion something that he, he can't reverse. And he sets in motion this, this, this enormous shift in the story that Jesus was about to usher in His kingdom. Now we have to pause because we've lived in the glow, the afterglow of the Gospels for 2,000 years. And we have the enormous benefit of 2,000 years of reflection, of ongoing revelation, of a commentary, of preaching, of discussion. We know the story so well that we forget the real resonating impact of the story itself. And so what I want you to do is, try as you might, to put yourself in that scene. And there's a few things to break down. And Pastor Dave, he's like, oh, be yourself this morning. I was like, are you sure? Like, are you sure? Just be yourself, it'll be fine. Are you sure, Pastor Dave? Because... Last night, as I was kind of finalizing my thoughts, I couldn't help but sympathize with Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of Jesus, and actually see him with sympathy for the first time in my life. So, if you're going to write emails, uh, direct them to Dave at HanoverMissionary.com. But there's a really significant shift in this story. And the moment the disciples start walking towards this cult into this city, where some scholars, scholars think that Jesus kind of had already prepared it, some things it's like this, it's miraculous. It, that's actually doesn't really matter so much as they're walking to go get this cult to start something that they've been waiting for probably from the beginning. 
And in this ancient context, the pre-resurrection context, this had enormous consequence because there's only two ways that this could go. There's only two ways kingdoms are built. They're built with power or they're built in submission. There's no other way for this to happen. And both had a common denominator of violence. Violence is the only way kingdoms are built. And it's done with power or submission. So the disciples, as they're going to get the cult, they're probably ex extremely excited that they've been following Jesus for, for almost three years now, maybe a little more than three years. They've lost their wages. They've been ridiculed. They've been mocked. Their lives have been threatened. There's this movement now that they feel the pressure that, that people are coming after their Messiah. They, they probably felt super valid. They go, finally, Jesus, just in time. You're going to take your kingdom just in time. Awesome. We're going to march into that city. All their arguments about who would be the greatest in the kingdom and who would sit at his right and who would sit at his left and what jobs they would have in the new arrangement of the kingdom. They're probably like circling through with this uh, huge excitement and nervousness. What is it going to be like when we come into the city? What is it going to be like when Jesus storms into the, pa into the palace? What God sign is he going to show? And the crowds that had heard, they were already asking, they already kind of knew something was up. Will Jesus come to Jerusalem for the Passover this year? Is He going to make it? Interesting, nobody knows. There was rumblings. And you hear it in John, the moment they hear, word spreads and the crowds start amassing on the outside of the city. Because for hundreds of years, the Israelites have been waiting for a Redeemer King. They hated Herod. Herod was a puppet king. He wasn't a real king. As I shared earlier, the, the, the priestly order was completely confused. And all sorts of corruption and uh, bribery and terrible things at the top kind of defiled the temple. So a common Jew would be like, finally, yes, we're going to relive the days of David. We have a real godly king take the throne. And they'd probably seen other revolutionaries. They'd seen other kind of king-like figures try to, try to take back the city and fail. But something was different about Jesus, and everybody knew it. Jesus ruled with power. He obviously had God on his side. And he ruled with this different kind of peace. He would be the true king of Israel. So they're elated. They rush to the side. And we know, we know the story from Easter, that they start breaking off palm branches and throwing down their coats. The coats they throw down in submission to welcome their new king. The palm branches they wave for, victor for victory. And they lie, start lining up this path. They had reason to wait for this king. They had been occupied for hundreds of years. Babylon was an, a decent occupier and Persia was actually almost kind to them. But for 200 years, Greece and Rome ruled them with an iron fist and subjugated them and violently oppressed them and, and hated them. And they were so excited to have a new king. And they thought, probably the disciples and the crowd thought, Jesus is going to come in. He's going to do some huge work of power and take the city by force, through God force. That's, that's how kingdoms are built. And he's going to do it. We don't know how, but he's going to do it. And so they excitedly go get the, dunk, the colt. And they bring it down to Jesus. Remember, there's only two ways for this to go. With uh, power or with submission. And the more practical, pragmatic people in this story, who actually you know, weren't, <laughs> they weren't looking at this through romantic eyes, they see a totally different outcome. This is where I have some sort of sympathy for Judas. Because Caiaphas said it right. The, the, the priestly caste say, look, if Jesus doesn't stop this, we lose everything. They had real, honest, legitimate concerns. Remember, this is pre-resurrection Jesus. This is pre-afterglow of the Christian witness. They had every reason to believe that if Jesus didn't stop doing what he was doing, he would amass such a following that Rome would have no choice but to come down with legions of armies and wipe the city out. There was historical precedence for this. This has happened before. 
and they were brutal and they were violent. Greece had done this before in the most horrific things you could imagine to subjugate these people. And so the priestly caste says, if we don't stop Jesus, we're done. Not only will we lose our authority and our prestige and what we've got to be comfortable, it's, it's, it's not the best arrangement, but we've made it work. We'll lose it and we'll lose the city and it'll be an all-out bloodbath. So Caiaphas actually has really sound wisdom. He says, well, why should we all pay for it? One, one man sh should pay for it. And that will satisfy that, that urge for violence. And Judas, you have to imagine, we had a discussion at youth a couple weeks ago. It really got me thinking. Again, in the afterglow of the Christian witness, Judas is a monster. He betrayed our Lord and Savior. Of, of course he is. I'm not, I'm not giving a pass for Judas. But if you had been following Jesus for three years, and you kind of already had a kind of a leaning towards like money and wealth and prestige, it's been a tough slog for the disciples. The message, what they kind of probably signed up for, it wasn't getting any easier. The, the huge crowd of the disciples that originally followed Jesus had kind of dwindled down to 12. Jesus' message wasn't getting easier to, to listen to or to follow. And now there was a, a, like a kind of a violent movement to eradicate your, your master. And Judas was probably very pragmatic. He said, he's probably thinking, if, if I don't do something, I'm, I'm going to be killed too. So he kind of took the wisdom of Caiaphas and he just applied it and just kind of wanted something out of it. And I think it wasn't just for money. If I, if I kind of read into the text a little bit, if you take kind of Caiaphas's view of power and authority and Judas's kind of view of authority, he's kind of buying into the next regime. He kind of realizes, you know what, this isn't going to go well for Jesus. I don't want to be killed either. I want to benefit from it and I want a place in the kind of the new setup. I don't want to be expelled like all my, other, all my friends, my other disciple friends. I want a footing in the, next, in the next kind of dispensation of the government after Jesus has been killed. Because remember, there's only two ways this can go. Either Jesus does what he says he's going to do with power, or he's going to be put into submission. That's how kingdoms are formed. And I think sometimes we have similar expectations of God. That we almost have unrealistic expectations, or we have really cynical expectations. And when we come to church, we've got these expectations like, you know, I want the, I want the glory, it's going to be so great, it's such a perfect place to be. And sometimes we think, you know what, church isn't doing it for me anymore. So I'll come, I'll get some kind of social interaction, but the preaching's not that great. You know, Amos is kind of boring. I, I, they ask for money a lot and, and volunteering, and I really, I really don't have a lot to give. So I'm going I'm to use it when I can, when I can, and, and when I, when I can, I'll kind of pass it off. There's one more character in this story that I think understood, even in part, what was about to happen, and that's Mary. Before any of this had started. In their home, in that quiet, tranquil moment, Mary takes out her expensive oils and she breaks the flask and she pours it on Jesus' feet and washes his feet with her hair. I don't think Mary knew. She made it a sense of where things are going, but I don't think she knew what was about to happen. I don't think she knew that Jesus was about to march into the city and six days later be crucified and that she'd be taking his body down from a cross. I don't think she expected that. I don't expect that, that she knew that in like a week and a half, she would see him resurrected. I don't think she understood that. I don't think she had any idea, but she gave what she had in faith and in love and in sacrifice. She breaks the flask, it's very expensive, pours it on Jesus' feet, washes it with her hair, even against the rebuke of Judas. And Jesus says, she's preparing me for my burial. Did she really 
believe that? I don't know. So, Jesus, the disciples bring the colt to Jesus. Something started that he can't stop now, that no one can stop. And the whole, the whole narrative in the, in the New Testament shifts to an end because there's, there's no way else it could go. And I can imagine Jesus kind of lifting his leg whoosh, and mounting the colt and whispering, let's go. And he starts down the path that will lead him to his death. We think, what do we expect from God and what do we expect from the church? These are questions I ask myself all the time. And I, I live and breathe church. It's, it's my life. And sometimes I'm frustrated. And sometimes I'm elated and overjoyed. And I was really, I was saying to Faith last night, like, we all have expectations. My wife is actually expecting our third baby. And uh, so that's the first kind of public announcement. You, yes, thank you. Which we're super excited about. We've, I have expectations. Now it's our third child. I sort of know what to expect a little bit. I know enough to know not to expect very much because there's not a lot you can control. We all have expectations. I know having a third baby is probably going to be hard. I know that I, I, I can expect things that when I stay up super late watching a movie, I expect to be tired in the morning. I don't expect my three-year-old to climb into bed with us and actually give us no sleep at all because my expectations are a little bit dashed. We all have expectations. It's not wrong to have expectations. But I was, just, I was kind of like trying to like make this land, like this image, this isn't making sense. Like the, the, the story is there, the, 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 the thesis is sort of there, but it's not making any sense. And I realized when we ask this question of God, what, like, what can I expect from you and what can I expect from the church? I think it's a question with a question. Who, who is the type of person that answers a question with a question? I do. It drives my wife crazy. I think that's what God is, He does to us. Not what can you expect from me. Not what can you expect from the church. I think Jesus says, what are you willing to give? You can fall in the camp of Caiaphas and Judas. You can fall in the camp of the disciples and the crowd. But what about Mary? What are you willing to give? Now, for Mary, it wasn't about the, 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 the cost of the oil. It wasn't, it wasn't the fact that even the gesture of what she did. It was the posture of her heart. That in faith, she would give out of love and give sacrificially. And she didn't know that in like six days, the very person she was giving to would give everything he had. He would lay down his entire life willingly to save the whole world. And then take it up again so that we can bask in the glow of his resurrection. And so as we come into this kind of new year with a new wave of ministry and a new a whole bunch of exciting things. And if you feel that tug of, you know what, I, I don't think my expectations are being met, Jesus. I don't think the church is, is really giving me what I want. Hear His voice. What do you have to give? What can you give in faith and in love and in sacrifice? That is the beauty of the church. That is what makes this gathering of people stand apart from every other gathering at every other community hall, at every other arena, at every other school. That's what makes this place unique. Is that sacrificial love we share because of Jesus. So let's, let's, let's pray. And I'll invite the team to come back up. Jesus, I thank you for your gift of love. I thank you that 
you uttered those words and asked for the colt and set in motion something that uh, history would never forget. That you came into the city and you brought in your kingdom. But it wasn't a kingdom of violence, it wasn't a kingdom of power, it wasn't a kingdom of submission, it was a kingdom of sacrificial love. I thank you, Jesus, that as a man you uh, endured, that you withheld temptation and you, 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 you didn't buckle under the enormous pressure that you were feeling. I thank you that you went to your cross and you died, and I thank you that you rose again. I thank you, Jesus, that we can live in the sacrificial love that you've given us. And I ask, Jesus, that you would help us with our expectations and my expectations from you and from the church and from each other that I wouldn't expect anything, but I would give freely, sacrificially, in love and in faith in following in, in your footsteps. So Jesus, help us to uh, let this story sink in this morning. Help us to remember that. In your name, amen.